These are the speaker tapes of Fifth Dimension Young People's Group Alcoholics Anonymous, a virtual group meeting every night at 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm Tasha. I'm an alcoholic and addict. Um, thank you. I love the poem. Uh, hi, Moses. I don't know where you are, but hello, friend. Um, and hello, all of my friends, all of my fellows. Um, this community here in AA is beyond just uh, people in a meeting for me. They are truly my, my lifeline. Um, and they have become that uh, in the past three years. I just celebrated three years last month. Um, I, my sobriety date is February 27th, 2020. I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. Um, I have interim sponsees and close girlfriends that I help who are uh, new to sobriety, counting days, uh, come back after, have come back after relapses, et cetera. Um, so I'll share a little bit about my experience, strength, and hope. Um, congratulations to everyone, first and foremost. I, I typically like to say congratulations for showing up, um, regardless of your day count, hour count, you're here, um, and you're keeping me sober by being here. So thank you. Um, I grew up in New York City, uh, born and raised in the Bronx. Go Yankees, please don't judge. I am one of three daughters. My parents are immigrants from South America, and my dad is an alcoholic who's now a dry drunk. My mom barely touched any alcohol in her life, but does have a lot of mental issues. Um, I am first-generation American, and growing up in New York City, as one can imagine, in the 80s, and 90s was very, very tough. Um, I developed a thick skin probably straight out of the womb um, because I had to. And uh, my family was Hindu, but my grandfather was Catholic. So I grew up with a multitude of different religion and spirituality from a very young age. Um, so I was pretty convinced by like the age of nine that if I were a bad child, one of the gods was going to punish me. Um, it could have been the fat one, the bearded one, the blue one, it didn't matter. So I was always, um, you know, trying to be a good kid. Um, my father being an active alcoholic as I, as I was growing up, he wasn't really there. So I was neglected a lot. I was left to my own devices as a young kid and isolated. I felt a lot of um, protection in just being alone. So I'd zone out, um, you know, I'd watch my TVs, I'd just play games. I just didn't make a lot of friends. But what, one thing I did have that I thought would connect me to my father was reading and education. Um, I tried to do everything I could to have my dad love me. Um, because I believed he didn't. Um, he was also abusive, you know, there, there was definitely physical and mental and emotional abuse growing up um, in the household and a lot of trauma built around that, um, hence why I also isolated. But I never questioned the way he drank. And if anyone that comes from the West Indies or any sort of like uh, cultural background that involves a lot of rum, you'd know that uh, they drink a lot and they dance a lot. And the point is to drink until you pass out. There is no sensible drinking. That is not, that's out, um, that just doesn't happen. You drink and you have a fun time and you make a fool of yourself and that's it. Um, so I thought, well, I love my dad so much. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna piss him off because I don't wanna get hurt. But I also don't want to drink like that. So I stayed away from alcohol for a very long time. Um, fast forward to teenage years. I went to a performing arts school in New York. I studied dance and theater and art. And um, and forgive me, I'm going to have to talk about a little bit about outside stuff because that, I hope that's okay. But that is a part of my story. But I'll keep it to AA. Thank you uh, as much as I can. Um, and also trigger warning, there is some abuse in this, but um, like I said, I was a good kid. And I, I mean, I, I was like on a roll. I just wanted to be the perfect person. 
And then when I was 17, I was raped. Um, that's how I lost my virginity from a neighborhood kid. And at that point, I realized, fuck it all. There's no reason to care about being a good kid or a good person or perfect. Clearly, I'm worth a piece of shit. I'm, I'm just to be used and abandoned and neglected. And as much as I try to seek love, I'm not never going to get it. So, um, yeah, let's go. And I picked up my first joint and my first <laughs> bat bottle of OE in a brown paper bag. And that started my career of uh, 22 years of active alcoholism and drug use. Um, and because I was a good kid and I, I was good on paper, I was able to maintain really good jobs. I wound up being a writer for a magazine right out of high school. Um, while going to college at night, I was a hard worker. Um, I was able to make the bell. And then I looked forward to the weekends because all bets were off. And it was pretty much all of a sudden, it was Thursday, Friday, I was making my calls, then Monday arrived. And that kind of cycle went on throughout all of my 20s. Uh, the men I dated were somehow in the world of alcohol or drugs, and I was using them for what they could give me because I was being used. That was my mentality. Um, by the age of 30, close friends of mine started to say, hey, do you remember what you did last night? Do you remember anything? And I was like, shit, I'm starting to black out. Okay, well, that's fine. I just partied too much. You guys are losers. Like I'm the first one at the party, the last one to finish it. I'm fine. I wasn't fine because at the age of 30, I was invited out to um, a, a concert after work and wound up being a two day bender and woke up in full consciousness in a dirty mattress in an attic somewhere in Brooklyn with people, two people I didn't know, um, with nothing but a little window and some light that was going through it. And I was pasty and cold and confused and just saw everything that we had done around me. And then that's when it dawned on me, shit, I have a problem. Um, so I started talking to some friends and one friend's father is a long-term, long-time AAer from the mustard seed in New York. And he met me. He didn't know me or anything, but he met me in front of the mustard seed. And he led me down the stairs of this room that looked to me like a bar because if <laughs> it was just dirty and pale and yellow and wooden and just, yeah, it was a bar. But I sat in the back. I was holding my fingers dear tightly. I was looking at the 12 steps in front of me and I was just looking at step one over and over again. And I was like, am I powerless? And is my life unmanageable? Well, I'm able to hold a job. I'm able to pay my bills. I'm able to keep friends. Uh, no, I, I don't have a problem. Am I powerless? Yeah, sure, I can party hard, but I've got time. And as I get older, um, this is all going to change. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And that rhetoric went on um, for about seven years. Um, I would walk into an AA meeting just to get an immediate um, reprieve from going to a bar. Instead, I would say, okay, I was feeling something from these meetings. I was getting something from them. And when people were sharing all walks of life, all looks, didn't matter what age, race, creed, it, it, this is a disease. It, it hit me so hard um, because everyone had my story. Um, and so I'd get like six months by myself, like just dry. Then I pick up and then it was off to the races. Then I would try again and I'd have nine months. I pick up again, I was off to the races. And that went on and on and on even though the, uh, you know, in the back of my head, these people were telling me this, that my story, I just was still in my own self-will. Um, the disease got worse and worse. It is progressive and in how it works, it is cunning, it is baffling and it is powerful. And I am 41 now. If I could look back at 
the 30 year old Tasha that went into her first AA meeting and told and would have told her what would have happened um, in her 30s, um, I would have stayed my ass in AA <laughs> um, and realized that I can't do it on my own. Uh, I had another traumatic experience with my boss and uh, he sexually, he raped me, but I have a hard time saying that, but I did go to HR and I reported him and I had backup. He admitted to it. He lost his job. I blamed myself because that's all I would ever do. Um, I decided to say, fuck New York. It's New York's problem, not me. So I'm out. And I backpacked across the country by myself. And I wound up visiting Hawaii. And I lived in Maui for three years in my early 30s. And I thought, jackpot, I'm in paradise. I'm far away from New York City. That's the cesspool. I'm done with that life. I'm, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be problematic with drugs and alcohol in Hawaii. Wrong. I was passed out on moonshine at 11 a.m. Random, random days, missing work. I was sleeping with whatever I could find. I was sleeping anywhere I could find. Um, that paradise became a hell very quickly. And I wound up finding myself in AA in the middle of paradise after um, three years of being there. Um, so I came back to New York and I got a great job in publishing and media, which was what I was doing for a long while. And I just accepted that I'd be an alcohol, alcoholic. And that led to now sleeping on the streets of New York City in my business clothes, makeup done, hair all done because I couldn't find the keys to open my own door after happy hour because I'd been out for hours on end. Um, it led me to fall asleep on stoops, peeing on myself, um, not caring what and how things um, unfolded for me. Um, it led me to a deep dark spiral of drinking now at the job. Um, it's a hell I don't wish for anyone. And at one point by the age of 37, I, I said to myself, just whatever higher power is there, because I obviously God had fallen to the gods had fallen to the wayside. I said to myself, um, just end it now, please. I I'm just can't do this. You're you're treating I'm you as in me, I was talking to myself. You are a walking empty vessel. You get up you do the same shit. You get up, you do the same shit. You get up and you do the same shit. End it now or keep going until you can't. Thank you. And right before the pandemic, I got a really good job, um, completely not in media. And I really started to care again. And a higher, this voice was lurking over my head. And uh, it was telling me, it was giving me a second chance. And I didn't want to listen to it because again, I really didn't care about myself, but I decided two months into this new job to give up cocaine, marijuana, cigarettes at the time and coffee at the time and alcohol all at once, cold turkey after 22 years. Then we got hit with the pandemic and New York City was in complete lockdown and I was alone in my apartment for months, suffering withdrawals. I had DTs, hallucinations. Uh, at certain points, I couldn't walk down my own like corridor. My, I couldn't cook, I, I couldn't sleep. It is something that I don't wish on anyone. And I spoke to a psychiatrist and a psychiatrist over Zoom, and he said, I think you have a problem with alcohol. I said, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Um, and I thought about AA and I thought about everyone in AA. I thought about the mustard seed. I thought about people in the last seven years that I had kind of come across in my sobriety here and there. And I was like, what are they doing? How are they staying sober? And so I called a friend of mine, uh, a close friend of mine who at the time had three years sober. And I said, Hey, how, how are you guys getting any connection in AA 
when we can't see each other. And he said, well, we have something called Zoom. We have Zoom meetings. Why don't you join one tomorrow morning, 10 a.m.? Here's the login information. See you there. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he's like, do you want a sponsor? And I had been avoiding a sponsor since the beginning because, again, I was in my own self-will. Um, but I said yes. I said yes this time because, again, I had seen where alcohol was taking me. I had seen what my life had become. And I was pretty convinced at this point that if I didn't do it, I was actually going to die the way I had wished for most of my 20s and 30s. So why don't I give myself that, that second chance that I kept hearing in, in my head? So I got that sponsor. She called me up. And she said, are you ready to get to work? I said, yes, ma'am. And we started on steps one, two, three immediately. And it was very simple in the sense of ease, write down your interpretation of God, write down why you think you're powerless, what has happened in your life. It was just literally journaling. And that was the process with me and my sponsor. And I was able to see it in front of my face and admit that I had hit such a rock bottom that looking at what had happened in my steps one, two, and three proved to me that my disease is out to get me, that I am not at fault, and that I am not capable of handling my own life without AA, without help. Um, then we worked on steps four and five and you know, that's when you start doing the work. Those are the action steps. And you start seeing your parts and you're like, holy shit. Oh, it's, it's very mind blowing. It is very trans uh, multidimensional, as I like to say. And one thing my sponsor says, and I say it to this day, and I say it to a lot of young women and even my guy friends now is just be gentle with yourself. She said that over and over and over again. Um, and I, now, uh, you know, the, the hope now, I'll get to this part, is after three years of sobriety, um, I have a home group in New York City. I have that same job that I got two months before becoming sober. I've been promoted to twice. They've never seen me drunk or drugged up. Um, I have the biggest life I could ever imagine. Um, I go out dancing, I go to art shows, I have go to live shows, I have friends I can actually talk to whenever I think I'm alone. I have such a strong spiritual bond. Um, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy to think that at the age of 41, I saw at the age of 40 sober. At the age of 21, I 25, I don't even remember those. Um, I'm able to to do the 12th step at any given point. Anytime someone just needs to talk, here's my number. You know, it's simple stuff like that to get me out of my own head. Because one thing I've learned in the first 90 days that helped me was taking notes. And I would hear a lot of newcomers, um, old timers say these, these phrases. And even to this day now, they help, but easy does it. Be where your feet are. It's one day at a time. Keep it simple. Um, it's a very simple program for a complicated mind. And the more I started working on myself and the more I started relieving myself of my own pressures and I turned it over in my step three to an idea that is greater than me, I started realizing how much I actually can love myself and that I wasn't worth being an empty vessel. And I wasn't worth being a, you know, a monotonous little robot just getting through to the next drug or alcohol. And um, I also realized more importantly that I wasn't a bad person trying to get good. I was just a sick person trying to get better. And when you give yourself that compassion and every time you say no, even when you're struggling, AA is a foundation of people, and that's why I call you my family, where a complete stranger can say, you are good. You are not alone. Talk to me. I am here. There are meetings. You will not be out left in the dust because for me, my disease, and I'll wrap it up here, what I've uncovered after 22 years of active alcoholism and drug use 
my disease is a disease of perception. It's a disease of negativity. It's a disease um, that plain and simple doesn't give a shit about you. It doesn't give a shit about me. It, I wake up every morning and the wheels are going off. The killer bees are, are buzzing. The monkey brain, the monkeys are swinging. They want to get at me. They want to say, I am low. Life is low. You, you just pick up that drink. You don't need to help yourself. And every time I say no to it and I'm of service, that's when I'm actually giving myself love. So um, for anyone that's struggling right now, and I know there's a few of you and for people who are counting days and even people with more time than me and just us in general, um, I, I just want you to know that you are loved. You are insanely, incredibly loved. And if you don't feel it in your heart right now, allow us to love you until you can love yourself. And um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end that. Thank you.